Hello and welcome. This is Professor Stefaro, and today's video is going to cover several things. The first is enzyme catalytic cycle, second, coenzymes and cofactors, enzyme inhibition, metabolic pathways and enzymes, and lastly, feedback inhibition. So here we see an example of an enzyme. This happens to be sucrase. Enzymes all have a three-dimensional shape that's unique. The shape is critical to their role as biological catalysts. So this is sucrase. It's a protein. Thus, we can see the alpha helices, the beta pleated sheets, and all the other folding in the molecule that leads to its complex three-dimensional shape. Let's symbolize the enzyme a bit more simply by illustrating the three-dimensional shape as a globular structure. So we will use sucrase as an example for how enzymes work. And one more simplification. Here's our sucrase again. So as a result of its shape, the enzyme has what's called an active site. This is where the enzyme interacts with the enzyme substrate, the reactant. And for this particular enzyme, it's going to be sucrose, which is table sugar. So this next video will demonstrate enzyme action using sucrase as our example enzyme. All right, take a look. An example of how enzymes function in the body is from the enzyme sucrase. Sucrase resides on the surface of the microvilli on the intestinal epithelial mucosal cell surfaces. This animation presents a graphical representation of the way that sucrase catalyzes the hydrolysis of the common disaccharide sucrose, which we know as table sugar, into its component monosaccharides glucose or blood sugar, and fructose or fruit sugar. Hydrolysis is accomplished because when the sucrose molecule binds to the active site of the enzyme, the enzyme's configuration is changed so that the oxygen bridge between the two monosaccharides is exposed to water molecules in the solvent. This exposure permits a water molecule to actually break the bond, the oxygen bridge, and attach the components of water, an OH to one of the monosaccharides and an H to the oxygen, which is still attached to the second monosaccharide. This effectively cleaves the bond between the two monosaccharides and converts the disaccharide into two separate sugars. Once this is accomplished, the enzyme's configuration is changed back to the original shape. The two monosaccharides float away, and the site becomes available for another sucrose molecule to bind, change the enzyme's configuration, and be hydrolyzed. This action can be repeated many times until the enzyme becomes denatured, is inhibited, or just wears out. Okay, we saw sucrase facilitating the hydrolysis reaction that breaks sucrose into glucose and fructose. Other enzymes might work to promote dehydration synthesis and build polymer molecules for the cell. Whatever the case, the video demonstrated a cycle of enzyme activity for every reaction the enzyme facilitates. So let's break down the steps of the process. The enzyme must first be available and in the same environment as the substrate. The cell is probably the place where this reaction would take place. So here's sucrose, our substrate, in the same physical environment location as the enzyme that will facilitate its breakdown, sucrase. So they must physically fit together. And this is why enzymes are built to specifically fit and bind to their substrate. So the substrate will bind to the enzyme, and then the enzyme will induce a fit onto the substrate. Next is the hydrolysis of sucrose to glucose and fructose. So this is where the enzyme facilitates that reaction. 
and then the products are released and the products here are glucose and fructose the two monosaccharides that make up the disaccharide sucrose next is coenzymes and cofactors many enzymes require a non-protein helper called a cofactor this will bind to the active site and function in catalysis some cofactors are inorganic such as zinc iron or copper if a cofactor is an organic molecule such as most vitamins it is called a coenzyme without the cofactor or coenzyme the enzyme can't bind the substrate into the active site so the reaction cannot take place most vitamin deficiencies happen this way let's take a look at the video about cofactors and coenzymes this animation demonstrates how B vitamin coenzymes must be present in order to enable some enzymes to carry out their functions. Many of the B vitamins assist in the complex biochemical processes that produce energy from food. The B vitamins are essential parts of coenzymes. Coenzymes are part of the machinery that allows reactions to take place. Enzymes are large protein molecules that catalyze biochemical reactions by lowering activation energies. Enzymes accomplish catalysis by configuring chemical reactants in the best possible spatial arrangement for reactivity. This enzyme catalyzes the release of carbon dioxide when producing energy from carbohydrates. Combining with the coenzyme helps the inactive enzyme achieve the appropriate three-dimensional configuration. For this reaction, thiamine must be present as the coenzyme. The green coenzyme molecule above is thiamine pyrophosphate, the cofactor needed to permit the enzyme and the substrate, pyruvate, to combine in the correct orientation to catalyze the reaction. Now all three molecules are nested together, and the substrate, pyruvate, combines chemically with the coenzyme, thiamine. The biochemical reaction can take place and energy, as ATP, and CO2 are produced as products of the reaction. Once this happens, the remaining complex, containing the two-carbon fragment, thiamine, and the apoenzyme, rearranges and releases the two-carbon fragment, acetaldehyde, and the ATP. The departure of the acetaldehyde opened the thiamine pyrophosphate to combine with another molecule of pyruvate and the cycle continues. Meanwhile, the energy is now in the molecule ATP and is available to do work or to be stored. Another way that a coenzyme can influence the reaction between substrate and enzyme is to cause a change in configuration of the enzyme without interacting with the substrate. Here you see the conformational change in the enzyme needed to configure the enzyme to accept the substrate in a lock and key complex. This is called an allosteric control. The cofactor approaches the inactive enzyme and bonds to it in an enzyme-coenzyme complex. The new configuration is a good fit for the substrate. Once this enzyme-cofactor-substrate complex is formed, energy can be released as ATP and the other reaction products can be released from the complex. Now the correctly configured active site on the enzyme is free to engage another substrate. The amount of B vitamins that are needed to serve as coenzymes is quite small. There is enough thiamine activity in 1.2 milligrams to meet the average person's needs all day. Extra B vitamins will not produce more energy. Excess B vitamins in the body will pass out of the kidneys into the urine. This table shows some details about several of the roles played by B vitamins as coenzymes. A chemical that interferes with an enzyme's activity is called an inhibitor. Competitive inhibitors are those that block substrates from entering the active site by actually binding in the active site, thus reducing the enzyme's productivity. Non-competitive inhibitors 
bind to the enzyme somewhere other than the active site. This site is called, often called the allosteric site and is referred to as allosteric control. We saw in the previous video how this kind of control works to activate the enzyme, but in this case, anything binding to the allosteric site will inhibit the enzyme by causing that conformational change, which just means a shape change, that prevents the substrate from binding to the active site. Let's take a look at a video that demonstrates competitive inhibition and non-competitive inhibition. During the normal enzyme catalytic cycle, the substrate encounters an enzyme with a specific active site to which it binds, forming an enzyme substrate complex. The enzyme then facilitates the breakdown of the substrate to its products, which part from the enzyme, leaving the active site free to catalyze another substrate as the cycle begins again. Competitive inhibition occurs when an enzyme encounters a blocker, which mimics the properties of the substrate and binds to the enzyme's active site. Thus, when the substrate is encountered, the active site is not available for attachment and no reaction will occur. Non-competitive enzyme inhibition involves the binding of a blocker to the enzyme away from the active site. This binding causes a conformational change in the enzyme, altering the shape of the active site, which prevents the substrate from binding. No reaction will occur as long as the non-competitive blocker is bound to the enzyme. Okay, many beneficial drugs act as enzyme inhibitors, including things like ibuprofen, blood pressure medicines, antidepressants like Lexapro, many antibiotics, and enzyme inhibitors have also been developed as pesticides. Roundup is a, an example of that, and they are also used as deadly poisons for chemical warfare. Okay, we're going to dig a little deeper, and we're going to talk about metabolism, metabolic pathways, and the role of enzymes. So first let's start off with a working definition of metabolism. This is going to be the sum of all the chemical reactions within a living organism. So how is that different from a single chemical reaction versus many chemical reactions that are going on in the organism? So to review, a chemical reaction is one reaction. It has a set of reactants starting materials and it leads to products and in this video we have an example that we use sucrose plus water goes to glucose and fructose and sucrase facilitated this reaction that was its role in this one reaction but metabolic pathways are different they are going to be a series of chemical reactions in which the product of one reaction is the substrate or the reactant for the next reaction. And each one will have a separate and unique enzyme that will facilitate that particular part of the pathway. An example of that is glycolysis. There's a lot of big names here because of the complexity of naming molecules. So look at the starting reactant, it's glucose, and our final product, which is pyruvate. And in between, there are about 10 different reactions for glycolysis, and each one has a separate and unique enzyme that facilitates that reaction. So glucose goes to glucose 6-phosphate and hexokinase, glucokinase is the enzyme for that reaction. Then glucose 6-phosphate now becomes the reactant for phosphohexose isomerase and so on. The naming isn't important here as much as the idea that reactions are linked to each other. So let's take a look at the biochemical pathway video 
and see if we can clear up any confusion. Organisms contain many different kinds of enzymes that catalyze a variety of different reactions. Many of these reactions, such as those involved in the biosynthesis of an amino acid, are carried out in a specific sequence called a biochemical pathway. In such pathways, a substrate is converted into a product by the first enzyme in the pathway, and the product of the first reaction then becomes the substrate for the next reaction. The product of the first reaction then becomes the substrate for the second enzyme. The sequence of reactions continues until the final product is made. When a biochemical pathway is functioning, the initial substrate is continually converted to the final product through the series of steps in the pathway. All right, last topic. Enzyme inhibition is an important way of regulating cell metabolism and individual metabolic pathways. In some reactions, the product may act as an inhibitor to one of the enzymes in the pathway that produced it, and this is called feedback inhibition. In the example, you see D is the product, and it will serve as a non-competitive inhibitor to the enzyme 1 that facilitates the reaction to A to B, which is the start of this reaction. The more D that is formed, the greater the inhibition on this pathway. And in this way, the cell can regulate the pathway through this feedback inhibition mechanism. All right, here's the last video, and we'll call it a wrap on this video. Thanks for hanging in there, and I will see you soon. Bye. Many of the enzyme-catalyzed reactions that occur in a cell, such as those involved in the biosynthesis of an amino acid, are carried out in a specific sequence called a biochemical pathway. In such pathways, the product of one reaction becomes the substrate for the next reaction. If the end product of a pathway, such as an amino acid, becomes available in the environment, it is unnecessary and wasteful for the cells to continue to produce the product. Cells, therefore, have the ability to shut down a pathway when it is not needed. In feedback inhibition, the end product of the pathway reacts with the first enzyme that is unique to the pathway. The reaction occurs at a site on the enzyme that is different from the active site, called the allosteric site. When the product binds to the allosteric site, the enzyme undergoes a conformational change and can no longer react with its substrate. There is no substrate for subsequent steps in the pathway, and the final product is no longer synthesized.